the tonight, tonight what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about pride and we're going to talk about humility. And uh, I couldn't help as we had that song up there. Uh, I think we might need to get an HDMI port switched up here too if somebody wants to come up here and make sure that's all connected. Uh, I don't have these words on the screen, but I couldn't help but think of Isaiah chapter 6 as we were, we were singing that song. And Isaiah chapter 6 opens with this picture of the Lord on his throne. As that song sings, the Lord seated on his throne. And here's what it says at the beginning of chapter 6. And I, and I want you, as I read this, I, I want you to picture this in your mind. As, as we talk tonight about humility, as we talk about tonight about pride, and how I'm going to say that, that that really has no place in the Christian life, and in fact, I think after we read this, we realize it really can't have a place in the Christian life. Um, as, as I read this, I want you to close your eyes and picture this scene in your mind. You can close your eyes right now. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Picture that. High and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Picture that. A God so majestic, so glorious, he is high and lifted up. And the robe that he's wearing, there's no space for you in the temple because it fills the entire room. That's how glorious he is. Above him stood the seraphim. These are angels. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. They couldn't look at him. With two he covered his feet, with two he flew, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. They sing this over and over. Verse 4, picture this scene. As they're singing this, the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke, meaning this voice of the Lord was so powerful, the building shook as he spoke. Picture that God in your mind. And I said, this is Isaiah, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Would you pray with me as we we open tonight? God, we come before you humbly. Honestly, God, because we have no choice. As we look at you high and lifted up, seated on your throne, your robe filling the entire temple. When you speak, the building shakes. There are angels, these majestic creatures that cannot look at you because of your glory and how it permeates the room. God, we cry with with Isaiah tonight, Woe is me. Woe is us. Like, because standing before you, God, we can't help but see how frail we are. We can't help but see how humble we must be. God, God, I pray tonight as we look at Daniel chapter 5 that you would help us to see how glorious you are. Help us to see, God, that Any ounce of pride that exists in our life really, truly has no place. It it can't. Help us to see you more clearly. Help us to understand ourselves more clearly. I pray tonight, God, and I ask that your spirit would be present in this place, inspecting our hearts, inspecting our lives, drawing us closer, and making us more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me to Daniel chapter 5, and let's get excited to study God's Word together. I love it. Um, Daniel chapter 5, it's in the Old Testament. The Bible has two, an old and a new. Uh, the Old Testament is going to be right after the book of Ezekiel, which is a pretty big one. It's about this far in your Bible. Uh, we're not going to get to the verses yet, but I'm going to have all of them on the screen uh, besides me. Beside me. I want to place this uh, idea before you tonight. I've got this on the screen. I I would venture to say that most most of us in this room would say that we 
desire to be humble people. How many of you, if you, if you were going to make a list of qualities that you would want to be, that you'd honestly say, uh, because you value this characteristic, that, that you want to be humble? How many of you would say that? I, I want to be humble, Lucas. I, I want to be humble. Okay, mo- most, if not all of you in the room, and I would say that about myself too. Hey, I, I want to be humble. Here's this idea that I'm going to put before you tonight. Uh, humility is our desired trait. It's what all of us want. However, pride is our default trait. We want this, yet this is who we are. We want this, yet this pride comes natural for us. It's our our default. Uh, Hadley and I, we have two vehicles in the high household. Perhaps if you've been around a collective for any amount of time, you've heard me talk about my lovely blue Prius called named Blifford. Uh, Blifford, the little blue car, not Clifford, named after Clifford the Big Red Dog, Blifford, the little blue car. Let's talk about is our other vehicle in the high household, uh, our Elantra named Lonnie. Everybody say Lonnie the Elantra. <laughs> Love it. Hey, a couple years ago, Lonnie, as she's affectionately called, had some issues driving straight. If you drive, it's really important that you're able to drive straight because most of the driving that you do is done driving straight. However, a couple years ago, Lonnie had some issues driving straight. Whenever Hadley and I would drive Lonnie, Lonnie naturally kind of wanted to lean to the right. So the only way to make Lonnie drive straight was to constantly, all the time, kind of course correct Lonnie as you were driving or just put more pressure on this hand so that your steering wheel would stay like this. Uh, I couldn't, you know, eat my sandwich and drive with my knee. Not that I would ever do that because we always have two hands on the wheel. Only at a stop sign, of course. I've spoken too much. Um, Without course correction, Lonnie would naturally, by default, go in this direction. And I have to constantly monitor Lonnie if she was going to drive straight. In a similar way, you and I naturally, by default, lean towards pride. Humility is our desired, yet pride is our default. We naturally lean in this way. However, for the Christian, for the follower of Jesus, and for many of you, say you're in this room and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, so grateful you're here. This is a fantastic place to come and learn what the Bible says about the God who created you, loves you, and wants a relationship with you. If you're not a Christian in this room, uh, I, I think even you would realize that, man, humility, yes, it is, it's a trait outlined in Scripture that Christians are supposed to have, but Christian, non-Christian, everybody, humility is a desired trait. Pride isn't an option in the life of a Christian. James 4, 6, here's what it says. But he gives more grace, therefore it says, this is talking about scripture, God opposes the what? Proud, but gives grace to the what? Humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble, i.e. pride really has no place in the Christian life. Note the problem here, right? James says God opposes the proud. Many, if not most of us, agree with what James is saying, and we would say, hey, we don't want to be full of pride. We don't like people that are just prideful. Rather, we want to be humble. We want to be around people who are humble, yet pride is our default. There's a conflict here because by default we're prideful, yet we want to be humble. And in fact, God calls the follower of Jesus to be humble. What's the solution? In Daniel 5, we're going to look a little bit at that. Our text in Daniel 5 is set up by the last verse of Daniel 4. So last week, I talked about the very beginning of Daniel chapter 4. I didn't talk about most of it, which is a narrative portion, but we're going to skip to the very last verse, verse 37, which sets up the scene for Daniel chapter 5. Daniel 4, 37 says this. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, everybody say Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, last time we're going to see Nebuchadnezzar because we're about to move on to a new king. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. For all his works are right, his ways are just. And get this, and those who walk in pride, this is again Nebuchadnezzar speaking, he is able to humble. That's the setting for which we go into chapter 5. And in chapter 5, the book of Daniel picks up several decades later. So years and years have passed. Nebuchadnezzar is gone, and we get a new king, a king named 
Belshazzar. Everybody say Belshazzar. Belshazzar, like you and I, I think he's quite relatable because he embodied and exemplified pride as his default trait. He was naturally, without trying to be, quite prideful. And again, get the the setup in the last verse, the very last verse before we encounter the king for the first time, it says in 37, those who walk in pride, he's able to humble. So you think something's going to go on with this verse and the next? I think so as well. So King Belshazzar exemplified pride, and as we unpack our text tonight, here's what I'm going to lay before you. I'm going to lay before you several, I'm going to call them warning warning signs that pride is creeping up in your life. I'm going to give you three warning signs that you might be more prideful than you think. And so as we unpack that tonight, uh, our goal is, as, as we see these things in our life and we allow the Holy Spirit to do business with these things in our life, these warning signs for pride, that ultimately we would submit to the Holy Spirit and let him do business in these areas, let him humble us in these areas because we don't want to live by default, we want to live by God's design. If you believe it, say amen. All right. Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Let's read these verses together. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of a thousand. That is the definition of a great feast. It's a lot of people. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought that the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. The first warning sign for pride in your life is this. You think you're in control. You think you're in control control warning sign number one daniel chapter five the setting here we saw in verse one it it begins with a great feast it says in the text there is a great feast and then it says there are thousands of people here clearly in, in in that's verse one clearly in verse two the king is a fan of the particular beverage that's being served so much so that when he tasted the wine in verse two he commanded that these these vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem long, 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 long ago when Nebuchadnezzar went into Jerusalem, besieged the city, defeated the Israelites, sacked the temple, got all the gold and silver vessels in the temple of the house of God, brought them back to Babylon. They'd kind of been sitting in storage. Then Belshazzar's like, man, this stuff is so good. It doesn't call, whatever we're drinking in, red solo cups, I don't know. We need the good the good glasses, the, the fancy china. Bring out the gold and silver vessels from the, the temple of Daniel's God and let everybody drink from them. They drank with them, and then verse 4 says, they praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. These were sacred vessels, vessels that belonged to the house of God, yet Belshazzar made them secular vessels. Belshazzar used these vessels that were designed for worship instead for wine. Do you see what's going on here? Belshazzar was using these things, these vessels that were designed to worship a holy God however he wanted to. In fact, kind of in a way, like, mocking God through taking control of this property of God's house and using it as he wishes. Essentially, he's saying to Daniel's God, to our God, to the only God, I'm in control. Your vessels, they're not yours. I can use them however I'd like. And in fact, I want everybody to have them, and I want to drink all the wine in the world at our great feast with them. Ha ha, God. We, by default, I think, believe some of the same things the king does. We think sometimes we are in control. The best example I can think of this as I, as I was thinking of how to illustrate this is the For You page on TikTok. Think about this for a second. 
I'm, I don't have any statistics, but you know the statistics. We've shared them here before. Teenagers spend a lot of time on social media, a lot of time on TikTok, a lot of time looking at a For You page on TikTok that is specifically designed, get this, for you, curated specifically for you to revolve around your individual interests. All the things that you want and don't want, I like, I don't like, from the tap of your fingertips, and you get a page algorithmically curated to give you exactly what you wish whenever you want at the touch of a screen. It's quite interesting. And I think sometimes when we look at this for hours and hours a day, sometimes we start to think that maybe life works a little bit like a For You page. And that life revolves around us, that we're at the center of it. That, oh, maybe even more, that we control how things happen. We determine our future and all of our plans, nobody else, because we're so accustomed to this is how we spend, this is the place that we go into all of the time, and that's its entire design. That's why you go back to it so much, because you love it. It's, it's curated for you. Many of us have much of our lives planned out. For some of you, maybe that plan looks like I, I'm going to pl- try out for the JV team my freshman year, sophomore, oh, get this, I'm making varsity, and then I'm starting my junior and senior year. Maybe I, even I'll go play JUCO two years, D1, professional athlete. That's my plan. Tell me that's not going to happen. Oh, how about this one? Some of you are dead certain that you are going, that you know without a shadow of a doubt that you're dating someone right now that you're going to marry in just a few years. Man, that is, that is the plan that you've set and your entire life revolves around it. Maybe some of you, your plan is I'll make these grades, I'll join these organizations, I'll lead in this way, this way, this way. And then if I do all those things, get this, the plan will work perfectly. I'll get into the perfect school that I want. All of my dreams will come true. That means I'll get the perfect job one day. I'll get all the money one day. I'll get the house with the white picket fence and the nice dog, and I'll have it all. Oh, sounds like a good plan. Hey, get this. What happens if those plans don't work out? Oh, how about this question? What happens when those plans, oh, no, what happens if those plans don't work out? What happens, catch this word, when those plans don't work out? I think sometimes the farther in advance we try to plan our future, one, uh, the less likely that those plans will happen. And if we're honest, rarely does a plan for our life actually ever go according to plan. James 4, 13 through 14, it says this, same chapter we looked at earlier, skip down a couple verses. I love these verses. They say this, come now you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. He's quoting, you know, come now you who say this, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life, James says, for you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. When you notice yourself getting too attached to certain plans for your life and you start to think you are in control, recall James' words here and hold your future, hold your plans with humility. Hold them with humility according to what James says here. The first warning sign for pride in your life is thinking that you are in control of it all. The second warning sign for pride in your life is this. You think you're better than others. You think you're better than others. Immediately following the verses we read earlier in verse 5, here's what the book of Daniel says. It says, immediately the fingers of a human hand, this is an odd picture, just so you know, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. So picture this. They're sitting here at this great feast, and then there's like this hand that kind of just appears, and it starts writing on the wall. 
naturally, if you were the king, naturally, if you were anybody at the feast, you would be a little bit confused. You'd have questions. Uh, I think that would be the natural thing to do. And so as we've seen throughout the book of Daniel, we see this, this pattern. If this is your first week, this is the pattern that we see throughout the book of Daniel. Whenever the king and other, other chapters, it was King Nebuchadnezzar, this chapter, it's Belshazzar doing the exact same thing. He sees this writing on the wall, and he doesn't, he isn't able to understand it or interpret it. Uh, he, he can't read the writing. With Nebuchadnezzar, he would have these dreams, and he couldn't understand them. And so when the king couldn't understand them, the, the first thing they would do is they would call the Babylonian wise men. They would call the Babylonian enchanters, sorcerers, magicians. They'd call them Chaldeans. All of these mean these wise people that were you know, very high up in kind of the Babylonian cabinet, if you will, the Babylonian government. They'd call them in. Um, but they couldn't interpret the handwriting on the wall. Spoiler alert, we've seen that, what, two, three, four times so far in the book of Daniel? And so then what does the king do? He hears, oh, hey, there's this Daniel, and he can do what you want him to do. So the king calls Daniel in. Daniel 5, 13 and 14, where we're turning now, skip down a few verses. This is the conversation that Daniel has with the king. This is the king's words to Daniel when they first meet. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king my father brought from Judah. I've heard of you, that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. I want you to notice here the degrading way that the king refers to Daniel. See this right here. Then Daniel was brought in. The king answered and said to Daniel, so far we're talking about a, a, a person with a name. And then he says, you are that Daniel. You can almost kind of hear it in there. You, he could have said, you are Daniel or hi, Daniel. You, you're that Daniel. Uh, and then what does he refer to him as? Daniel's lived here in Babylon for decades, by the way. He refers to him not as a person, not as a wise man, but one of the exiles of Judah. Meaning, you still don't belong here in my kingdom. You're kind of still an outcast. What's interesting is that earlier in verse 11, the queen, when she's like, hey, king, uh, there's this dude who can interpret the handwriting. Here's how she speaks of Daniel just verses earlier. She, the queen introduces Daniel in verse 11 and says that your father, Nebuchadnezzar, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers. So when Belshazzar calls Daniel in, he could have said, hey, Daniel, you're the chief. You're important. You've done really cool things, and I appreciate you. Instead, that Daniel, one of the exiles rather than one of us. To Belshazzar, Daniel was no chief, no person of importance, no one who had done anything good for the kingdom. Rather, he was just an exile, and Belshazzar clearly thought that he was way better than Daniel. I think that you and I are, are often prone to compare ourselves to other people. When we, when, when we encounter people who are different from us in any way, shape, or form, when we encounter people perhaps that don't have something that we do, we tend to think, by default, I might add, that we are better. We don't often say this, of course, because we're humble, but that doesn't mean we don't think or believe it. A telltale sign that you think you're better than someone is when you think or speak poorly of them. A telltale sign that you think you're better than someone is when you speak or think poorly of them. So my question to you, is there anyone in your life that you speak or think poorly of? there anyone in your life that you think or speak poorly of perhaps it's someone you know perhaps it's a family member perhaps it's a friend perhaps it's someone you don't know someone out there and perhaps maybe you don't speak exclusively poorly of them but there are things that you say about them that frankly you wouldn't want them to know there's a reason you say it just in your head or behind their back when we speak poorly of people or we, we do this because we want others to know how bad they are so that 
they can see that we're not like them, that in fact we're better than them. And I think sometimes, and this might get a little bit close to home, sometimes I think that we even speak poorly of our brothers and sisters in Christ, in the family of God. Sometimes I think we speak poorly of those that we rub shoulders with on Sundays and Wednesdays. People that, if they know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, will be standing right next to you singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord for eternity. When we think we're better than others, we mistakenly assume that the cross is for them but not for us. We mistakenly assume that they need Jesus but we don't. We forget that we are equals before the cross of Christ. We forget that we are equal sinners before a holy and sovereign and glorious and majestic God. No one better than the other. So when we're tempted to think or to speak poorly of another because we think we're better than them, remember this, that Jesus died for you too. In the same way that Jesus died for the sins that we so love to point out, let us not be a people who forget that Jesus came and died for you too. Pride has no place before the cross of Christ. The second warning sign for pride is thinking that we're better than others. The third warning sign for pride is this. You think you're invincible. You think you're invincible. As Daniel, after Daniel interprets the handwriting on the wall here, uh, Daniel chapter 5 ends. Uh, and it's actually the last time that we hear of Belshazzar. The king comes in at the beginning of the chapter, and we're going to see in the end of the chapter in these verses, uh, the end of Belshazzar in Scripture. Verse 29 through 31, here's what it says. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed. It's the last we hear of him. Verse 31. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So we first encountered the king in verse 1, remember, throwing a great feast. So great that he said, vessels from the house of God, gold and silver, those are mine. I can do with those whatever I want because I am the great and mighty king Belshazzar. Here we see that king in verse 29 thinking the same thing, meaning he's looking at his handwriting, can't understand it, but still that doesn't yet humble him. He doesn't realize that he isn't invincible. He still thinks he is even though he couldn't read the handwriting. All that to say, uh, he's giving commands in verse 29, and then shortly after, verse 30, he's getting killed, and then quite frankly, forgotten in verse 31. Belshazzar was killed in 30, the very next verse, and Darius the Mede took over. He received the kingdom. We hear of him no more. You and I sometimes are prone to believe that we're invincible, that we're untouchable, that consequences and unfortunate circumstances don't apply to our lives. We think we're invincible because we fall back on certain things that give us security. We fall back on certain things that give us confidence. I think as, as middle schoolers and high schoolers, oftentimes we fall back on the fact that we're teenagers. We fall back on the fact that we're young, that we're youthful, that we're healthy. Maybe we fall back on the integrity, the security, the wealth of our families. I, I, I don't have to worry because my family will just take care of it. Look at them. We fall back for some of us on our intellect. Man, I can figure anything out. You ever been in here before, Lucas? Man, I'm smart. We fall back on our athletic abilities. I can, I can do whatever I set my mind to because look at this body that God gave me. Man, I'm good. I am good. We place our hope and trust in these things thinking that we can weather whatever storm comes our way way that we can kick down every door that we want to because we place such confidence and hope in these things here is my question what about when they don't 
What happens when the injury completely derails your athletic career? You've seen it happen. News stories all over. Yet we think we're invincible, that it won't ever touch us. I think the people that the injuries happen to probably think the same thing. What happens when a tragedy threatens the integrity of your family? Nobody ever asks for that stuff, but it happens too often. We say it'll never happen to us because by default, again, we don't try. This is just what, how we think. We think we're invincible. And when the storm comes and completely takes away that which we place our security if we think we're invincible and, and the thing that we place our trust and confidence in completely is taken, guess what? We're lost completely in the process, swept away. So my question for you is what do you place your security in? Put differently, if your athletic ability, your academic ability, your financial prosperity, your good looks, whatever that might be, is taken away from you, would you be okay would you be okay if it was gone like that if not let me just say you might be a little prideful the third warning sign for pride is thinking you're invincible the secret to humility is realizing what daniel did and what daniel says in verse 21 as he's Speaking before the king, revealing the handwriting on the wall, he says a number of things. And one of the things he says occurs midway through verse 21. This is he's talking to what happened in, about happened with Nebuchadnezzar in chapter four. And he says this near the end. That Nebuchadnezzar, remember, in chapter four, verse 37, he said he's able to humble the proud. This is what Daniel says. Nebuchadnezzar realized until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. Our default is to think that we're in control. Our default is to think that we're better than others. Our default is to think that we're invincible. But here is the reality. In reality, the Most High God is in control. In reality, we're just, just as sinful as everyone else around us, even if our sin looks different than theirs. And the Most High God, who is truly invincible, He is God who fills the temple. The only one who is invincible made Himself defenseless, made Himself vulnerable, made Himself just the opposite. He hung on a cross carrying the weight of your pride and mine. Carrying the weight of your sin and mine. He died, was buried, rose again from the grave three days later, giving us something to actually take pride in. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says this at the end of the chapter. So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, let the one who's prideful boast what? Not in yourself, but in the Lord. Maybe you've heard this before. Oftentimes people will say that humility is thinking, humility isn't thinking, I'm going to read this one to make sure I get it. Oftentimes people will say that humility isn't thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. How many of y'all have heard that before? Some of you in the room, lots of like half hands, it's like maybe I've heard it. Um, let me give you a more biblical path forward. Humility isn't thinking less of yourself. Nor is it thinking of yourself less, but it is thinking of Christ more. Humility isn't thinking less of yourself or thinking of yourself less. Get this, you need to just get out of the picture. <laughs> Humility is thinking of Christ more. Let the one who boasts, 1 Corinthians, boast in the Lord. If we're looking Man, if we really desire, as we raised our hands earlier, if we really desire to be humble, for those of us who are followers of Jesus, if we really desire to be obedient, the solution to pride and the key to standing firm, the name of our series, to standing firm in your faith, no matter the storms that come, the solution 
This humility that's defined as not thinking less of yourself or thinking of yourself less, but ultimately making Christ the focal point of your life. Because when you get the image that Isaiah lays out in chapter 6 that we started with, when you get that that's who God is, you cannot help but bow down before him. You cannot help. Woe is me, the great prophet Isaiah says. I'm a man of unclean lips. I, I have nothing to give or speak about because I can't compare with how awesome you are. As we close, would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? Here is what this means for our lives. The last thing I want is for you to walk out of this place with an action plan. Lucas gave me three steps to be the most humble person in Gainesville in 2024. We as followers of Jesus, action stands, action steps can be helpful, but ultimately we need to be conformed to Christ by his spirit. So, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, The first thing I'd like for you to do is confess your pride before a holy, sovereign, awesome, majestic, and glorious God who fills the room. Nathan's going to play, but for a minute or so, I just want you to confess where you've been prideful. Confess where you've held your plans for your life a little bit too close. Confess where you've spoken or thought poorly of someone in your life, because frankly, if you're honest, you think you're better. Confess it before God. Confess those things, I'll call them idols, that you put your hope, your security, your confidence in. Confess it. Lord, I put my hope and confidence in the fact that I'm 15 and I look good. <laughs> I can do whatever I want. Man, I'm the best football player on my team. Confess that that is the idol of your life confess your pride and as you confess your pride as, as the Holy Spirit inspects your life inspects your heart and you come honestly before a great and awesome God in heaven, <laughs> so great and awesome that he lets us come in all of our imperfections before him, <laughs> I want you to hear this from the book of 1 John. It says, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, if we confess our sins, get this, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word's not in us. Before a great, awesome, and holy God, because of the cross of Jesus Christ, you don't have to be afraid of your sin. You don't have to hide your sin. You don't have to stick your chest out and be like, mm, I'm better than so-and-so. You can be honest before God. As we confess our pride, as we confess our sin, we know that Jesus Christ was faithful and just to forgive us. That's step one. And step two, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want you to focus your mind on Christ. I want you to picture Christ dying on the cross for you in your place, knowing just how prideful you are, knowing just all of the sins that are in your life, Knowing just how big, awesome, glorious, and majestic he is. Remember the one who filled the temple with his presence. The room trembled at his voice. That's the one looking at you and saying, I forgive you. Listen, if you're in this room tonight, and you said, Lucas, I, I, you're talking about humility, you're talking about pride. I, you're talking about what this means for the Christian life, and, and maybe you're in this room and you say, hey, I'm not yet a follower of Jesus. Your first step tonight is to confess 
with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And scripture says that you would be saved. Hey, here's my invitation for you tonight. If you would like to be a follower of Jesus, to be forgiven for all time of all of your pride and all of the other junk in your life, if you'd like to confess that he is Lord and become a Christian tonight, hey, with head bowed and eyes closed, would you just raise your hand? Say, Lucas, I want to follow Jesus tonight. Lucas, I'm not, a fo- I'm not a Christian yet, but tonight is the night, and I want to give my life to Jesus. If that's you, would you make that decision tonight? And would you tell me just by raising your hand? Hey, if that's you tonight, would love to talk to you about your next steps as a follower of Christ. For the rest of you tonight, would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we come before you tonight humbly. We come before you tonight full of pride. God, but we lay it all before you and we ask you to do heart surgery in our lives. We ask you to make us more like you because you're the only one who can. We're done trying harder. God, we just lay it at your feet and ask you to do what only you can do. We love you. We're grateful for you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. You can stand as we sing one more song. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living